All right, everybody. So for our next talk, uh, Samantha Dalby from Nuboco is joining us. Um, she leads their efforts in outreach for computer science education for uh, middle school and high schoolers as the regional contact coordinator for code.org, right? Um, and so she's going to talk some about what they're doing, kind of some things that are working and not working, and hopefully give us some ideas about uh, what we can also do here in our community. So please join me in welcoming Samantha. Hello, test, test. Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about literacy of the future and how computer science is kind of bringing the art into STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And um, I work for a nonprofit in Cedar Rapids called Nuboco, and we do a lot of things. There's this big umbrella of stuff. And they're all, they are all actually connected somehow, even though it doesn't seem like it always. But I'm mostly connected with Imagination Iowa, which is our K-12 STEAM initiative. And I'm going to talk about um, the art in computer science because I'm trying to contain what I'm talking about today and kind of stay on time, hopefully. So let's talk about some of the jobs. And if you've been here for some of the other sessions, we've kind of covered some of these. But I'm going to go through a transition of you know, things that we're all familiar with, like 1995-ish, I think. If anyone see it here, Toy Story came out. And it was really exciting having animation. It was so cool. And now it's old hat, right? We're used to this. Yep, another Pixar movie came out. That's great. But people don't usually think about, and especially kids these days, don't think about how computer science goes into creating that. They, they see the artwork, and that's great. They don't think about the technology behind that. Fashion. So um, everyone, their Fitbits and things. This is also kind of standard now. Um, this one is actually a Wiseware, where um, you can program it to do different things, like if you fall, you can push the button. It looks fancier than the little dongle we had. You know, if I fall and I can't get up. This is also kind of a standard. We're used to this. But a lot of technology goes into it. And it's artistic, because you're going to wear it and hopefully like what it looks like. Now we get kind of into some things that it makes sense when you say, oh, yeah, this, this kind of makes sense. But people don't jump to it as an initial computer science artistic area. So this is artwork that was created using fractals, so very math-based in our STEM area, and computer science to generate the fractals, and then sold as art. Also in the art theme, we have algorithms and machine learning that's taking artists' work and analyzing it, which humans are, are quite good at doing visually, analyzing, oh, this is a Monet. This was done, done by Van Gogh. And they can replicate it by having those machines analyze it. And then up at the top here on the left, you can see just an image. And then you can see how it replicates it based on the artist's drawing. So it seems maybe simple, right? We just brush, oh, yeah, you throw it in the machine, it spits out the artwork. But what happens in between there is really complex. Because our brains can say the brush strokes and the, the color usage and all of these things that we see and can understand, we have to train those computers to have a brain that can process that and then replicate it. Another area that art historians are using is actually analyzing the connections of artwork like this. And so we've got centuries and centuries of artists, right? And we've had decades of studies going into it by art historians. And they can find connections based on, oh, this Van Gogh and this Monet are similar because X, Y, and Z, the political environment or the, the type of art that it is. But if you put it into these algorithms, and they can find things and identify them, but then when they can't is when the art historians come in and say, well, why can't it tell the difference between these pieces of works? And then they can say, Oh, right, right. So they, they were friends, or they were in the same social circle. So they were influenced by similar things, and they're drawing more deeper conclusions based on what technology can help us analyze. And then they get kind of into some of these different uses. I'm just going to let this play for a little bit, maybe. So maybe not. Um, so anyway, what is happening here, you can kind of see, is that he is doing a live performance of music, but he's coding the music. So I previously always thought, OK, electric music, you know, synthesizers, or you're recording things, and you're editing it, mixtape mix type stuff. 
but he's actually doing live performance of coding the music and doing that. So that's something that, you know, music brought into computer science in a live performance arena is really exciting and not necessarily what kids getting exposed to computer science think of. I know what before I went into computer engineering, I thought, you know, this is what computer science was, sitting in front of a computer, and kind of is, but in a more engaging way, right? They're doing live performances here. And then we talked about the fashion area already, but if you think about fashion leading to design areas, this one is maybe a stretch on the artistic front, but if you think about creating this contact lens, which has sensors on it to sense glucose levels in an eye of someone that has diabetes and being able to send that back, there's a lot of complication in the design of that. Are you able to put a battery on there or is that too heavy? How are they still able to see through the contact lens while having these sensors on there and getting that benefit? So there's actually design in something that's not necessarily beautiful, although some people will find beauty in this too, but designing that so that it's functional and applicable. So we've got the kind of, yep, believe it, old hat, that kind of stuff. The, yeah, that's in the realm of believable. And then some of these things are kind of on the fringe, but computer science is there. It's still existing um, and just not something that we always think of. What's next? And if you went to the first session, you can see some of that out future stuff. Well, I want you guys all to think of a field a job, a career, something that's not computer science, okay? Think about that, picture it in your head. And I'm gonna ask you some questions about skills, okay? So raise your hand if this, this job or field requires self-expression, okay? Does it require problem solving, okay? Does it require analysis, okay? What about communication? All right. So does anyone want to share what their field was? Sure. Garbage collector. Garbage collector. All right. Anyone else? Veterinary. Veterinary medicine. OK, so these skills are not unique to any one field, right? They're used everywhere. So what makes computer science interesting is that you have that technology element, but you have to merge them all together, and it's engaging. Right? So in schools, we can get these students to build these skills in an engaging way so that they can have jobs in research where they have to analyze data. I've heard people that are going into research fields, academia, biology, things like that, where they say they no longer cannot have the skill of doing computer science because they fall behind in analyzing all of the data that they have, that they have to process. Um, modeling and architecture, much more in the artistic realm, they use technology not only to do the modeling, but also the testing of it. So you build a model of a house, a physical model, and you put it in a wind tunnel, and you program that wind tunnel to decide if it's going to blow the roof off or if the, if the wind's going to go over it. So there's that artistic element, but using the technology to define it. Who here shops online? Okay. So e-commerce is a huge area where technology and computer science is used, but you can't just have a website anymore. Oh, no, no, no. Right? It has to look good. It has to be functional. So then you have human computer interaction, which is definitely tied into this artistic element and being able to understand it, making it easy to use, making it engaging. So it's not just selling something online anymore. It's making it usable and, and interactive. Does anyone use online banking? Yeah, we kind of want it to be secure. That would be a great thing, right? And so the creativity in that is making kind of figuring out how people could hack into it and preventing that, coming up with different things there. And then um, over here, anyone in Iowa familiar with one of these tractors? But does it look kind of weird? What's missing? Yes, so self-driving cars, sure. But we already have self-driving tractors now. And there's a lot of processing that goes into that and also the design of using it and have it making sure that it's functional and that when it goes over that hill, it doesn't start driving off the slope like this because they didn't calculate for it for that hill to be there and they were assuming it flat, right? So all these problem solvings, creativity can go into either design world or into other areas too. So we're gonna talk a little bit about education. Let's see if I um, can get, okay. There was another video, sorry, technical difficulties. But the video talks about our educational system 
and how it used to be and how it kind of still is, where we sit there and we, we consume it, we sit and get, um, they use a great an, um, analogy of the hose and spray model where the teacher stands up there like I am doing right now and they spray information. And if you understand it, you get it, then you're a good student. But if you don't like how it tastes or maybe you were distracted by something, then you're a bad student because you didn't learn the right way, right? And so we need to move more into a model of students being able to learn how they learn and engage it and, and stop doing these Carnegie units of math is over here, English is over here, biology is over here, and start doing what the real world does and in integrating those. If we have specialization, that's, that's good to a certain degree, but if we're so specialized that we don't understand and have empathy with what the area, other areas are doing, then that's a hindrance and it's not a benefit anymore. So another video that I was not planning on showing, so yay, <laughs> but this is one that I would highly recommend you go check out. It's Pay, Pla uh, Play, Passion, Purpose by Tony Wagner. He did a TEDx talk, I think, in 2012. Um, and he talks about how he interviewed innovators, and then he went and found the mentors and teachers and parents that they said really had an impact on their lives. And what he found was that those, those mentors or teachers or parents encouraged them to be creative and to play and to explore things in a way that led them to their passion, in a way that led them to find their purpose. And so his, his goal is trying to find a way to do this more in schools across the board instead of just having these individuals that you randomly run into. We want to, we want to get more students engaged in this manner. So how do we do that? And how do we do that with computer science? So my theory is that computer science captures the interests of students long enough for them to engage in the learning process. So we can sit down and we can learn something, we can read about it, you know, we can listen to the teacher explain it, but really doing something with it and using it is what engages us and makes it internalize that information so that we can recall it later and apply it to different areas. But what makes that special about computer science? Because we said all of these different skills are used in all these different areas, so what about computer science? Well, the thing with computer science is you can learn the theory, you can talk about it, but at some point, in, in order to understand it, you have to build a project, right? And those projects, you can be given the same goal, but everyone's going to look different. It's similar to writing an English paper. Everyone has to read this book and you have to write a paper about this. Does anyone ever have the same paper, unless they've copied each other, right? No, they're all different because we all think about things differently, we have a different perspective. And so computer science can bridge all of these different areas by making it more engaging and the students get to create projects that are meaningful to them and help encourage them to go deeper into what their interest is in a certain topic. So these are the big seven ideas of computer science that's kind of used um, in the US where they're trying to figure out what this computer science thing is and putting it into K-12. It's kind of fairly new um, and I like to kind of do my exercises with it. So if we start up in the middle here, we've got algorithms. That's, I don't think anyone's going to complain about that being a computer science thing. Big data and information, um, clearly in that, that realm. Coding, everyone always thinks of coding for computer science. The abstraction and problem solving is kind of where, you know, that happens in math and science and other areas. The internet, yes, computer science, but that's also in some other areas. But the things that I think are most interesting about this image is the creativity part and the global impact. And those are the two big ideas that I think that support this peacock image with computer science. And that's where it starts to get into areas that are not computer science fields and how it kind of expands out. Where you can be in marketing and that's where you wanted to go in your field, but if you have that information about how computer science can Im impact your area, you're even stronger and you can work better with the rest of your team. So how do we do that? In schools, okay, so in schools, this is K-12 now, so we've done the careers, we're moving backwards, I always go backwards in life. <laughs> so we had the careers, we talked about, what do we do in school, what does that look like? So teachers always say, yeah, that's great, but you're just gonna add burden onto my day, how am I gonna do this? So picture this, okay, we still have our separate classes because education is hard to change, but you have an art teacher that collaborates with a science teacher and finds out that they are learning about the life cycle of a frog in science. So the art teacher in the art class says, all right, we are going to design the different stages of the life cycle of a frog. That could be in clay, 
could be drawing it, could be a collage, whatever it looks like. Then those students take that back, and the program that I like to use is Scratch. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But they can animate it, they can draw it, or maybe they find characters that already exist in the program to uh, represent those different stages. And then those students, either working individually or ideally within a group, are going to animate it and control these different parts. Now this student, I, did, I actually went to go create a, a project and found that someone had already done this. So it was like, perfect. They, they led right into it. So this student created it and they have it kind of move around. They have it hop up. So they were working on movement. Now, meeting students where they are is big in my world. You know, not everyone's on the same level. So it could just be that they, they draw their item or they find something that represents it and they figure out how to show it and hide it at different points. And it's as simple as that, right? Or they can do something that's more elaborate. So that gives them that, that wide array of options of what they do. But as a teacher, you're able to figure out, OK, do they understand this? So you're doing comprehension. You can throw reading in there, because they could be making things um, talk with talk bubbles. It could be a requirement that you put on their project. If you do it in a team, ideally you get collaboration. And then because everyone has different interests, and unfortunately not everyone will become a computer scientist, you have kids that maybe are more engaged in the designing of the characters. That engages them. You have more kids that are engaged in the programming of things. But they're working together to work on those skill sets that are combined. So then this is just one example of how you can take the art world, the computer science world, and the science world and kind of merge them together so that you're getting that cross-disciplinary um, interaction. One other example, bring it to math because math always gets a bad rap. So if I were a teacher and I were standing up here and I said, today we're going to learn about the Mandelbrot set. It's a set of complex number C, C, for which the function does not diverge when iterated from zero, Z equals zero. Who here is engaged and excited about learning about the Mandelbrot set? Yes, we've got one. Right, so most teachers are probably not just going to sit up here and do that. Don't think it's that simple. But if you give them an image then and say, this is what comes out the other end, right? Then you've got some more kids like, whoa, we're going to learn about that? That's pretty cool. So how do we get there? Again, in my, my friend Scratch, now this is not Mandelbrot set. I found something a little bit more simpler so we don't have to sit there and watch it iterate. But then you can have them program something that's obviously very complex over here in the coding area. But it's visual. And if you see, you can change the iteration so they can see how it changes and they're interacting with it. So then you're getting that math component, you're getting the visual component, and you're getting that control aspect of how it happens with, through the computer science. So really, the computer science is kind of a venue for applying the basic skills you want in the other areas and getting them to dive deeper into their understanding of it. So then we kind of go to the pre-K through 12, and parents say, OK, I get it. Computer science is really important. My kid's going to be behind if they don't know it. So I have to stick a computer in front of them from the time they're born. And then we say, nope. You can actually do other things that encourage the computational thinking, which is defining the problem, right? figuring out ways to solve it, and then implementing it without a computer. So what about games? So the middle one is kind of an obvious. It's called Codemaster Programming Logic Game. So if you want to be very direct with kids, this is what you should do. But if you take um, Connect Four, Rubik's Cubes, Tic-Tac-Toe, you're playing all these games with them anyway. And it's something that our, our brains figure out how to play, right? And then they get old enough, maybe in elementary school. And then you say, well, remember that game we've been playing since you were five? Let's turn that into an app. And there are a million Tic-Tac-Toe apps, right? But this is going to be their app. And they get to choose how they do it with staying in that set of boundaries. So this is kind of an example of how you can prep them when they're younger. Who here read Choose Your Own Adventure Books? S. So literacy related to computers. Who knew? Um, one example that I like that's fairly recent is Andre Curse, or for the computer science people, and Recurse. Um, and so in this story, this, the little boy is going through school, and he has to keep going to school until he learns all of his subjects. So it's very much in the Carnegie unit section still. But he doesn't get to be done with school and going to school until he gets through all of them. So that's kind of a fun, engaging way for kids to go through that. Um, Hello Ruby was a Kickstarter. It's a story about a little girl, and it has nothing to do with computers. 
but she solves a lot of problems um, that she's given by her dad. And then the whole back half of the book is all offline activities that go from easy up to more advanced, where it deals with problem solving. Um, they can create their own like paper computer at one point. Um, and then it does a lot of like problem solving things where it'll show pictures of Ruby and she's wearing different clothes. And it'll say, on Mondays, Ruby only wears polka dots. So which one is she wearing? And then it gets more complex where it says, on Tuesday, she only wears something that has blue and stripes, but not something else. So they have to go through that kind of thought process. And this is all stuff that can prep them for going into computer science without it even being related to a computer. And then getting closer to the computer stuff, but still literacy is another Kickstarter. I'm a big Kickstarter fan, just so you know. Um, Cubeto is a wooden robot that does tactile computing where they have to put blocks on a physical board and it tells the computer, the robot what to do. But they tie it with these stories. And this is an example of their expansion kit where it has like a story about going to Egypt, a space one, underwater, and it has maps, so a big, canvas map that the robot moves around. And you can follow the storyboard. It's great for kids anywhere from about three up till seven. But the thing I really like about it is that you can do it with a, that age group and they can work on their motor skills by putting the blocks in and also color identification. Then you can get them to do the problem solving. And then if they follow the story, it shows them extra examples or tidbits about the topic. And um, they can start doing things on their own where they have to you know, get from point A to B but only taking two rights and a left. So you're putting more constraints on them. And the board actually has something that has a subroutine. So I'm getting to a little bit technical information. Sorry if you don't have that. But um, what that means is that it's something that you can use to repeat. And so they're given a certain number of blocks, but if they need more steps to get somewhere that they, beyond what they have, they have to figure out how to partition what they're doing into something that they can repeat over and over. And so that is a huge step for that young age group to go into. And it's done in something that's very fun and engaging for kids. Everyone knows Lego blocks, building blocks. Um, that's a great way for more physical activity and building things. And then Tangrams is another example of ways to be creative and kind of that problem solving. How does this fit into what I'm used to? Cooking, how does cooking relate to programming? Fractions. Recipes, fractions, yes. So I loved, I loved doing the cooking one. Last year we had a summer camp that was actually cooking and coding where they would do um, cooking activities and talk about, oh, how does this taste weird? What, what do we put too much in there? So we made something that was actually wrong and they had to figure out what ingredient there was too much or too little of, so it was debugging it. Um, and then they would do problem solving and they'd, they'd take it back and then do like the coding aspects of that. So taking some of the, the, something that's not at all related to a computer and then figuring out how it relates to things that you use in general life, but also computer science. So what, what are our supports in having this happen? Because right now I, I talk to a lot of teachers that want to do this and they're like, I just don't, I can't do this on my own. I can't go and figure out this computer science thing on top of teaching what I'm already supposed to be doing. So what exists in the world right now to kind of help us get to this point. I mentioned Scratch. Um, this is a free tool that MIT creates. Um, it's, it's younger generation is Scratch Junior, so that's for the younger kids. Um, but this is what we saw earlier where you can do the animations, you can link it to storyboards so you can create um, movie-like environments, but they can do storyboards for books, so you can do it in English class. Um, you can use projects that are already there and what they call remixing it, so you don't have to start from scratch. Every time I do a scratch camp or event, someone always finds someone who created Donkey Kong or Mario Brothers or last summer it was Slither.io, and they all get distracted. And if I, if I have like another adult that comes in, they're like, oh my gosh, you've lost control of this class. Um, it's actually not. It's a great way to say, okay, you found this engaging game. Now let's open it up and see how they created it. And that gives me an opportunity to, to talk to them about how these projects are huge and they were not created in one day or even probably one week, maybe even not one month. And at that point, they were going, whoa, like, there's a lot of work that goes into this. And they probably weren't done alone. 
And then what I have them do to dig in is say, okay, I want you to go into this game that you found and I want you to change it. Figure out if it's scoring, if it does you know, one point increments, figure out where that scoring happens and make it do five points. Or if something is in there, like it has a character, figure out how to make it change colors so that it flashes. So then they get them in there and they're digging through something that already exists, but they're, they're in control of what they're doing and they're playing around and exploring. So these are some great opportunities. The Scratch Junior one is for younger kids. It has very little reading at all. It's mainly just numbers where you try and tell it to do how many things, like a certain number of times. Um, the other thing they have is assessment tools that you can use on their website. And um, it has activities that you can do to see if they, they have that comprehension of what they're doing. The other thing I like about them, uh, the Scratch Junior page, is that they have large printables that you can um, cut out and laminate, and then the kids can do a tactile version of coding where they put it on the floor, and it's always fun for the kids to make the teacher run into the wall. So if you have them do those in order a certain sequence, and then the teacher has to follow their instructions and they run into the wall, that's like the best thing ever. Um, Future Learn, has anyone heard of Future Learn? Hey, one person. Um, so they, I believe, are based in the UK, but they have a lot, it's not just computer science, it's all over the board, health, anything you name it but they have um, a lot of free options and then sometimes you can pay a little bit for an upgrade or something to be able to access it a little bit longer I'm currently taking a course that's like differentiating for learning and stem teaching just so I can understand more about the teaching side of things um, but they are a great resource for finding stuff I think they are also have Raspberry Pi tutorials and stuff like that so they um, and they're not the only one but just online learning in general um, is a great access for teachers this is a fairly new one, I think it's about a year old, mathsciencemusic.org, and they are collecting free lesson plans for teachers, uh, parents can use them, that are based on math, science, and music. Now, not all of them are computer science related, but they all kind of integrate different things. Um, and this is a, a great place that, if you have ideas and you wanna share them, they would love that, but if you're also looking for something, this is a place to check out. And then specific to computer science, in the US we had a big initiative last couple of years that culminated in the K-12 computer science framework. Um, it's not a set of standards, but it can be used to create standards. And its goal, <coughs> excuse me, was to provide um, idea of what students should be able to do at certain points in their academic career. So it'll have things like by the end of second grade, they should have this understanding in these different categories by the end of fifth grade, these, this set, by the end of eighth grade, twelfth grade. Um, and so this is being um, encouraged for states especially to use to define their standards for computer science within the state. Um, if the state's not there quite yet, then school districts um, or even just school administrators can use this as kind of a support to get their mind wrapped around what the computer science is and what they should be doing within their schools because it's pretty broad. So in our state, so this is specific to Iowa. This is on the code.org site. If you go to code.org slash stats, you can see it for any of the states and you can do a checkup and comparison. Um, and this is always kind of the part that makes me sad, but also excited. Um, as you'll see for Iowa, our stats, um, they, they update the top part every month. And our open computing jobs hover around 4,000. And then you'll look right below it and see only 364 computer science graduates. So there's a big gap there. Um, if you also dig into the extra fact sheet, you'll see that in Iowa specifically, the average pay is like $74,000, which is like three times the state average pay. And so the, the part that kind of makes me sad is that when I went to school, everyone assumed that you had to go to the coast to get a job in technology. And we have so many jobs in Iowa that are not being filled and no one knows about them, and no one's really encouraging students to go into this field. So, and you don't have to do computer science to be in these. I mean, you can study it, you can take a class in it as part of another field, but just having that knowledge opens up the doors to even if you wanna go away first and come back, um, but there are so many opportunities here. The second section, the policy environment, is hopefully changing very soon. Um, right now it says no, no, no across the board for Iowa um, because we don't have anything currently but there is legislation that's being um, pushed through. It's, it's positive so far, um, and it would cover requiring all high schools to at least offer one computer science course by 2019, I believe. 
um, and then also provides some support for teacher professional development in computer science. So hopefully that will change very soon. And then the last section is AP stats, which is also one of those downer sections usually. Um, only 8% of schools teaching AP computer science and then the demographics of who's taking those, those um, tests. So um, if you're more interested in more of these details or if you want to track it every month like I do, you can go to code.org slash stats and they update that. Also in Iowa, we have the Governor's STEM Advisory Council. Um, they cover all of STEM, but also under their umbrella, they have an organization called Code Iowa, which deals with computer science. And there's also a computer science working group. And they do recommendations to the state, to the um, Department of Education in Iowa. Um, they also help STEM scale-up grants, so help getting um, more STEM activities. It's usually like a kit that um, basically like those boxes, you know, you can get shipped to you at home, but it's for schools where they'll have a larger kit um, of some STEM topic that they can apply for, and then that helps the, the teachers kind of get that kickstart in, in applying STEM in their classrooms. Um, I do work with code.org um, as a partner, so Hour of Code, has anyone heard of Hour of Code? Yes. So it started off as a challenge to just do one hour of code to expose students to computer science, and it's really blown up since then. And NuboCo is the regional partner for the state of Iowa. So what that means is we help teachers get absolutely free training in computer science. Um, we mainly focus on middle and high school. Elementary school teachers also have that opportunity. It's just a one Saturday weekend for them. But middle and high school, it's a five-day summer training and then four workshops in state that is covered by code.org's wonderful um, partners and sponsors. So those are some wonderful opportunities for teachers. This is our first year. We're going to have a cohort, two cohorts going through um, the training. There are still some high school spots open. Middle school is all filled up because there's really not much else out there right now. Um, so those are awesome for resources. The other thing with them is that even if teachers don't go through the training, all of their curricula are completely free through Creative Commons licensing um, forever. And they are awesome lesson plans where it tells you the, you know, the objectives, the purpose of the lesson. It tells you about how much time the activities will take. It tells you the materials you're, you're going to need to have beforehand. It has videos um, about things that the teacher should know. And then also videos that you can use with the students as well as vocabulary words so the teacher understands what they're talking about. No computer science background known for these. It's total like boot camp style, like you're going to be an awesome computer science teacher when you come out of it. And then we've got schools in Iowa, and this is just the one that's most close to here called Iowa Big, that are project-based learning. So these are alternative options to the traditional sit in your seat, go to English, go to math, et cetera. Um, and how many of you guys are familiar with Iowa Big? So that happens to be housed in our building. But they um, take juniors and seniors mainly. I think they're trying to push it earlier and earlier. But they do project-based learning through partnerships with the community, for the community. And so this is another way to find ways to engage students and find what they're passionate about before they go on to college and get them engaged. Um, a lot of times it's the students that you know don't get that good drink of water um, and our, our bad students that flourish in these environments and flourish with computer science because it's so open-ended and it gives them that control in their life back. So what can you do in communities? Um, Coder Dojos, who's familiar with Coder Dojo? Yay! Um, so Coder Dojo is a global movement with local chapters. Each chapter has its own specific, how they do it, um, their own twists on things. Um, we do things as far as, and we aren't just coding either the way we run ours in Cedar Rapids. We do um, squishy circuits, conductive circuits, 3D printing. We always have an hour of code station. Um, so it's kind of all over the whole STEM, STEAM spec spectrum. Um, but there's definitely computer science that's available there. Another thing that we're trying out, <clears throat> these are all free options, um, family code night and family creative learning. So family code night is basically hour of code, but the idea is that you get the adult figure, could be a mentor, a parent, um, guardian, and the students to do it together so that not only the student gets excited, but the parent or guardian can see that they're excited and understand more about what it is. One of the things we find is especially with at-risk students, they get excited about something, and then their environment says, well, you can't do that or that's not for you or for people like us. 
you can't do that. And then it kind of squashes that excitement. And showing them and giving them more tools to say, yes, you can do that. Here's how you can do it through your K-12 experience and then launch you into all of the many options that are after that um, is really helpful. And the family creative learning is um, more of a, I think it's a five week successive program that an entire family could do. So kids, younger kids can do it too. It um, uses Scratch and then Makey Makey kits, which are um, electronic circuit type things that are basic, like very basic where you have alligator clips, clip it on there and you can put, stick them to bananas or whatever that's conductive. Um, and this one is built around community building. So there is a meal involved, there's a community time where you get to know the families, and then the family does a project together. And at the end of the five weeks, they present it either to their group or to the community. And so these are great options for getting the word about computer science out and also getting people engaged in encouraging students to um, progress. So specifically, what, is you, what can you as individuals do? So figure out what you're passionate about or figure out what a youngster in your life is passionate about and how can technology or computer science be involved. So here, who here likes gardening? I do not. <laughs> so my, my um, big example to talk with people, you like gardening, so figure out how you can program sensors to tell you if uh, it needs watered or not. Okay, and you don't have to do that, but you can be the support network for the student or students to explore that and figure it out. Now, how far it gets, you know, maybe you reach out and find a, a group that does circuits or something like that, and they help them do the circuit part, but you are just there to be the encourager, and you're helping them explore, right, and figure out how these different things connect. Ask, usually nicely. So ask schools to offer computer science and tell them why it's important, or have them talk to someone like me to tell them why it's important. Ask um, government to say that it's something that we need to support, it's really vital to our economy, things like that. But it, it always starts with asking and then helping them, you know, those support networks that already exist or those schools to kind of move along that path. And volunteer, who here knows how to com do computer programming, computer science, anyone? All right, so everyone else, you can still volunteer. You can still be a mentor. Um, events like Coder Dojos, they need someone to check people in. They need kids to have someone that don't know, like they need an adult to not know with them, to show them that it's okay, that learning doesn't stop after you graduate from high school. That was something that I thought, like when I was younger, right? You go through school, you learn all the stuff, you go to college, you learn all the stuff, you're done and life is wonderful. Well, I'm still figuring it out. Um, but this volunteering and mentoring is a huge component, no matter what your skill set is, because computer science is everywhere. And so your skills are going to help somehow with their learning. So hopefully I did okay. Whew, yes. All right, so I'm going to open it up for questions and um, This is work. Okay, yeah. So I don't see how it can't be adding to the teacher and the student, right? I can see how it's integrative and how it can be on their topic, but they literally, they'll have to learn how to use it, how to teach it. The students will be doing that. I mean, if I'm thinking about what the frog looks like and how it's going to move, I'm not learning something about frogs in terms of biology or so. But I don't think that's I don't think that's a problem in that I, I think we need to do this, but I think we need to do it like we teach languages or we teach the sciences. And I think we need to rethink those things, right? I'm not, like, I studied French in high school. Mm -hmm. It was, turned out to be great for some parts of my college, but it, it generally wasn't useful. The way I, I ended up studying science, but the science I studied in high school was terrible. I mean, it, you don't learn anything about the thinking. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you ask people, going through the same kind of chemistry or physics I did, what those things are. All they know is how to do experiments that someone else has already done, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. all the things you're talking about, thinking about the framing of problems or, do I mean that? So I think that kind of thinking, which would fit in nicely with computer science, if we can teach kids how to think about scientifically, to think like engineers, mm -hmm. that's helpful. So I guess, does it make some sense that until the tools get up to pace where the tools literally can sort of seamlessly be integrated at like the elementary school or, you know, I mean, if I'm teaching kids, mm -hmm. that probably it's going to always be an additional thing. But 
that the sooner we can get it in as an additional thing, the better. And probably in some ways, we're going to have to compete with and maybe push out some of the, or at least be in addition to, like I said, the, the other languages, if we think about it that way, or the other sciences. Does that make some? Yeah, and that's, and that's a common problem that I hear. Did you want to? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, so that's a common problem. And it's, it, it can be viewed as a, an additional burden if it's built in that way. And I'm not saying this is a simple problem that we'll solve right here, because it looks different for every school and every teacher. But what we're, what we're trying to do is find ways to swap. Right? So take something that their teacher's already doing, they already have planned out for the year, and instead of doing it on a worksheet, how can they do it with computer science? So it's, it's, there is that, that additional ramp of the teacher figuring that out, and that's why we're trying to provide that training. But ideally, the teacher should always be doing some sort of training, right, to kind of... Well, yeah, except they've got to do 20 things they're not getting paid for. You know what I mean? That's why I think we have to... I think the teacher's complaint is one you're going to keep. It's going to be a real barrier, right? They're constantly having another thing added that they've got to do on top of what they're already doing that they're not getting. Then they've got to go another Saturday or go another summer. Right. And so something we're trying to do for that is get them paid for the training that they're doing for computer science. Yeah. So, so the the high school level, um, I have that going through to be approved for graduate credit. And that boosts pay depending on how the whole you know, education structure stuff works. So yes, that's absolutely an issue. And the, the thing behind the code.org specifically is that they, they see that and they want to put their money where their mouth is. And so we're trying to get it to be a good experience instead of a bad experience for teachers doing this training where, oh yeah, you have to give up your time to go do that. So it's abs you're absolutely right, yes. And, and, and that's something that we're striving for, to get teachers to have stipends for the training that they're doing to, so that they can and then get credit so they can get paid more and that kind of stuff while they're also bringing better tools into their school and providing this benefit for them, yeah, for the students. We need to own that we are adding, but we'll, we'll make it worth your while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and hopefully we're not adding in a way of um, adding more time to what they have to teach, right? Because you only have 180 days or whatever to teach your content, but teaching it in a different way which initially, you know, for teachers that have been teaching for 15 years, they have to change what they've been doing, and that can be a hurdle too. Um, but hopefully, we're making it a easier transition. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, so much. I just wanted to uh, kind of follow up too on uh, the just the problem solving side of it too, and. You heard that a little bit in what Nick was presenting earlier mm -hmm. too, and so uh, very complementary to kind of a design approach. But how do you how do you help kids really just start to think and articulate what's what's the problem, and then working at a solution? Uh, so I just love that, uh, and so that they're not like here's the answer, and let's go apply the answer. It's let's let's figure out what the problem is first, and then how do we solve it? So I think that's a great skill set, regardless of. Uh, kind of discipline, so kudos mm -hmm. to pushing this along. And I'd love to follow up with you later about some also potential outreach stuff, uh, so thanks. Yeah. yeah, and along those lines uh, with the problem solving, one of the activities I like to do with kids is have a broken program. So again, in, in Scratch it's easy to do where you create something and it, it doesn't work, but you tell them what it's supposed to do. And the first time I did it, I figured, oh, these kids are gonna get so frustrated and they're gonna hate it. And they loved it. It was the most engaging activity that we did the entire week because they were like, oh, well, it's supposed to do this. And they all found different ways to do it, right? They, they solved it in different ways. And then allowing them to share how they did it, just, I, I could have done a whole day just doing that. And then they wanted to create their own. So I let them create their own and they shared it with the group and, you know, pass it around so that, you know, the kids could solve it. And they said, oh, well, well I, when I took it apart, you know, I thought it was going to do this. You're going to do it that way. And the other kids said, no, 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 you, didn't you know that you can do a messaging block and you can send it here? You don't have to wait for time. You can, you know, they just, and so the, the capacity that kids have to do things differently when we allow it is just huge. And then they, that really gets them engaged in going deeper into their learning. Anything else? All right. Uh, if we could please thank Samantha for uh, giving this great talk.